Welcome, and thank you for joining us for a special presentation of UCLA Political Sciences' You Heard It Here lecture series. On February 24th, the president of Russia implemented an unjust military invasion on the democratic nation of Ukraine, which has now devolved into a full-scale war between the two nations. The world, with a few notable exceptions, responded swiftly with unified condemnation of the invasion, followed by government sanctions and military and humanitarian support. Notable in our lifetime, we are watching an unprovoked war on the democratic people in real time, often with hourly updates from the front lines, which is without precedent. Our motto in the Division of Social Sciences is engaging LA, changing the world. And today's discussion hosted by the UCLA Department of Political Science demonstrates what we do best, bringing leading experts together to discuss pressing issues facing our world. My sincere thanks and gratitude to Timofi Mylovanov, president of the Kyiv School of Economics, who is remarkably joining us live from Kyiv today. Daniel Treisman, professor of political science and renowned Russian scholar, and Robert Traeger, associate professor of political science who will moderate today's discussion. It is my pleasure now to introduce Michael Che, chair and professor of political science to introduce today's discussion. Well, thank you so much, um, Dean Hunt. I, um, this is really a, a a uh, very wonderful and uh, great occasion for us. And we're really honored to have our guests um, here to talk about, um, like um, Dean Hunt said, the uh, um, invasion and attacks on Ukraine. We'd like to offer our solidarity to the people of Ukraine and uh, um, our solidarity to all victims of war and all displaced peoples everywhere throughout the world. So um, our first panelist will be um, Timothy Milovanov. Um, he's the president of the Kiev School of Economics. He's associate professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh, and his paper, Optimal Allocation with Ex Post Verification and Limited Penalties, uh, co written with Andrei Zapachelny, is forthcoming in the American Economic Review. We we're very, very lucky to have uh, Professor Milovanov here. Um, he's zooming in live from Kyiv. Our second panelist is uh, Dan Treisman. He's uh, one of the world's Russia specialists, specialist in Russian politics. He's been a professor at UCLA, my colleague, since 1996. He's currently visiting. Uh, he's a visiting fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences um, in Palo Alto. His book um, with Sergei Gurya called Spin Dictators, The Changing Face of Tyranny in the 21st Century is forthcoming in Prince University of Press in May 2022. And our moderator, moderator today is um, my colleague, Robert Traeger. He's been here at UCLA since 2006. He's a specialist in um, war and diplomacy. Um, his article, Women's Suffrage of the Democratic Peace, Female Voters Loathe the March to War, um, with Jocelyn Barnhart, Alan Dafoe, and Elizabeth Saunders, came out in Foreign Affairs in 2020. His book, joint with Jocelyn Barnhart, called The Suffrage Peace, Suffragist Peace, is forthcoming in Oxford University Press. So just a few moments about, a uh, few, few comments about the format. So um, there'll be 15 minutes of um, presentation from Professor Malavanov, then 15 from Professor Treisman, and then um, Professor Traeger will um, moderate comments and questions. So if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box. And um, so again, thanks so much for everyone's participation. And uh, uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Traeger. Great, uh, thanks, thanks, Michael. Um, I'd like to start today's discussion by acknowledging the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Almost 3 million refugees have left the country in recent weeks and an unknown number have been displaced internally. Around 600 civilians, according to the UN, recently have been killed, uh, and an entire population is living in fear of, of random, tax, seemingly random attacks. Uh, this has resulted in the largest war in Europe since 1945. And uh, as others have said, I know many of us would like to express our deepest sympathies uh, to the Ukrainian people and to others affected uh, by by the war. Um, one of our panelists, as has been mentioned, is speaking to us from the middle of this war zone, and we're deeply grateful to him uh, for taking the time to talk to us, and we hope that he and his family are keeping safe. Uh, so our first of two speakers, uh, as Michael mentioned, uh, is Timothy Milo Milovano. Uh, he is the president of the Kiev School of Economics and a former minister of economic development, trade, and agriculture of Ukraine. Uh, as well as the deputy chairman of the board of the National Bank. 
As an economic scholar, he has published in leading journals, including Econometrica and the American Economic Review. And speaking personally, publishing in Econometrica is one of the most impressive things, impressive intellectual things uh, that a person can do. During the 2014 Revolution of Dignity, jointly with other leading economists, he founded Vox Ukraine, aimed at increasing the level of economic discussion in Ukraine. He joins us from Kiev in what we are obviously aware are extraordinary circumstances, and we're very glad that he has. He will now speak for 15 minutes, approximately, followed by Professor Treisman. Professor Milovanov, the virtual floor is yours. If you're ready, please begin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I guess you know the the situation is so fluid in in Ukraine that um, you know every time it's um, something different to talk about. But I think um, I'll try to focus both on the bigger picture and on details on the ground. Um, the bigger picture, I think, um, I. Here are my points. One is that uh, it's become clear that Ukraine has agency. And uh, it's been painful for us, for Ukrainians, to be dismissed, let's say, as uh, our economy or our military are weak or going to collapse on the second day of invasion or something like that. And the, the Western press too, Russia press of course was full of this, but Western press too was uh, full of this kind of um, logic and uh, understanding. And I think that didn't happen. Our banking system continues to operate. Uh, our gas stations have gas. There's food in grocery stores. Um, right there are the hospitals are operating in all areas. And our military is resisting and uh, doing this quite successful, of course, with the help of modern weapons from the West. And this is very helpful. Uh, but at the same time, daily uh, people are dying. You know, yesterday we, you know, Russians bombed uh, one of our iconic uh, churches and monasteries in the east of Ukraine. And they also bore, uh, bombed a training center, um, a military training center next to the Polish border, 20, 20 kilometers, which is about 14, 13 miles from, from uh, the border. Um, and uh, they, actually, they, they shot 30 missiles yeah, at the center, only eight landed. It appears to be that the air defense of Ukraine is functional um, and uh, quite successful because they were supposed to be fully overwhelmed by 30 missiles shot from different strategic bombers at the same time. But, you know, so these are technicalities which uh, I never thought I would be thinking about, but, uh, but that's what it is. And um, then um, we also have students, you know, I, I'm the president of the Kiev School of Economics, so we have students. Um, and some of the students got stuck in the areas where, you know, which were occupied by Russians. And I've heard really horror stories from our students. One of our students, she's just 16. Um, the troops kept her in the basement for two weeks uh, and together with other families, and they wouldn't give them water. So I do not know how you, you know, it's, it's impossible to imagine for us what kind of um, life that is. But uh, they survived and they got out. But I worry that in places like Mariupol or Kharkiv, the civilian death toll uh, would be or will be much higher. Um, I also would like on a bigger kind of scale or from a bigger perspective, think of this as a uh, not in isolation. Ukrainian war right now, the war of Russia with Ukraine is just one episode in many, many other episodes. One episode um, of uh, maybe it's the fifth war of Putin because there was Georgia in 2008. And then, um, then there was um, Syria. There was Ukraine slightly before that. There was Chechnya uh, before Georgia. So these are four wars and Putin believes that he has won them and he has never been stopped after this war. So his every time was emboldened. 
Uh, and now he just uh, went uh, doing what he was doing in all other countries at just a larger scale, much larger scale. And um, he also prepared quite well strategically. For example, Belarus has lost its sovereignty. There's a concept of pseudo sovereignty where the country controls everything except foreign policy, military policy, and domestic uh, um, policy, the police, domestic law enforcement. And uh, we have seen that we're, um, foreign policy of Belarus is aligned with Russia and uh, military of Belarus uh, provides resources for Russia. And Russia had, not, had Russia not had access to Belarus, they wouldn't be able to attack Kiev from the north rule who had defended the south quite uh, successfully. So, you know, there was a design to this, uh, the uh, suppression of Belarusian uprising uh, or elections and making Lukashenko fully dependent on Putin for staying in power. Um, was uh, was incremental and instrumental in um, helping uh, Russia being able to launch this uh, offensive. Without uh, that episode in 2021, um, this invasion wouldn't be possible. So there is design, there is strategic design to what Putin does. And um, that's something to keep in mind, because what I see usually that the discussions are done in isolation, you know, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Ukraine, Crimea, these are not isolated incidents or episodes. Um, in terms of um, global economic effects, I would like to mention a couple of things. First of all, the, there is a possibility for a major uh, food crisis because Ukraine and Russia together have about 20, 20 uh, 25, maybe 25 to 30% of total um, wheat supply um, in the world. So the prices will go up and they will mostly hurt, of course, uh, Asian, Middle Eastern and African countries, but that will target um, the price and rise of inflation elsewhere. And then we have energy issues and it's really, really appalling that uh, some of European countries today um, are much more dependent on Russian energy than, for example, Ukraine. You know, if Ukraine can diversify away from Russia, um, then so can the European countries. And then there is an issue of logistic and global trade. Um, this uh, region from Baltics to the Black Sea to Turkey is critical uh, for railroad uh, routes for China to be able to ship a lot of goods to, um, to, um, to Europe. And so that is going to be disrupted. Uh, uh, substantively. And finally, um, I think in terms of sanctions imposed on Russia, I think uh, it is very important that de facto sanctions are large and strong, stricter than the euro sanctions, because companies supplying critical or military related um, elements uh, or inputs to Russia, basically refusing to, to interact with our, or supply currently in Russia, even if it's not sanctioned. So Russia, I, and I think that's another miscalculation of Putin that he thought that maybe there will be sanctions of a financial type or maybe pol political sanctions, diplomatic sanctions, but um, that he, they will run out of access or they will not have access to critical inputs. That I think is new and that will uh, make sure that uh, Russia's ability to wage this war in, you know, in after a while will be severely limited but uh, ukraine needs to survive this after a while and people are dying daily or hourly right now we're actually having a um air raid warning but we're just ignoring because they're so frequent now um so that we can't uh, you know otherwise we just have to live in the basement so we, we refuse i think to live in the basements we've given up on this but uh, I think that um, people are dying because of uh, air attacks, and it would be great if the EU and North America would th seriously think about no-fly zones. I understand that people are afraid of escalation, so specific implementation, but that can be done. And uh, whoever is thinking that escalation can be avoided by uh, not protecting Ukraine, I think is delusional and ignores all the empirical evidence. So if, um, if there are other views on this, I would, I would really ask everyone to, uh, to base those views on evidence as scientists and scholars should do, not on opinions. 
And finally, I want to appeal to everyone. And I think it's our responsibility as humans to find out the facts and figure out what is really happening when other humans are suffering. And uh, we, should, um, we should act if we feel that something is wrong. So it's our fundamental human obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lovanov, um, for that um, very clear articulation of the situation now. Uh, and now we will hear from Professor Daniel Treisman. Uh, Professor Treisman is a noted scholar of politics and Russian affairs. Uh, he Guys, is Professor he here. So that's actually, uh, I have to evacuate. So my apologies. Okay. Okay. We understand. We can hear. We can hear it. Uh, we have a. I have to evacuate. Unfortunately, thank you. There is a. There is an attack coming. We can hear it. We if I can, I'll come back. Thank you for joining. Right. Well, I suggest that we continue. As bizarre as this is. Uh, and as strange as it feels to have uh, a discussion of uh, what feels uh, all too uh, removed uh, to us compared to uh, compared to what what was not at all removed uh, to uh, one of our participants. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I suggest that we we continue for now uh, and um, and turn to Professor Professor Treisman. Uh, who, as I think I was saying, is a noted scholar of politics and Russia, uh, Russian affairs. He is a professor of political science at University of California, Los Angeles, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. A graduate of Oxford and Harvard universities, he has published five books and numerous articles in leading journals of politics and economics. He has met and spoken with Vladimir Putin and is one of the most interesting and best placed people in the world to comment on events in Ukraine in their broad political and economic context. We are glad to have him with us today. Professor Treisman, the virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and first I wanna start by saying just how humbling it is to appear here today together with Timothy, who, as you saw, had to, had to leave. Uh, Timothy has stayed in Kiev. He's uh, been uh, lead, continued to lead the Kiev School of Economics to check on the students, the faculty, and also to organize uh, fundraising and uh, to try and uh, uh, drum up more donations for the resistance effort. So as Rob said, here we are three weeks into what looks like the biggest war in Europe since 1945. And so an obvious first question is, how did we get here? And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the Russian side. Uh, um, and, and the answer, uh, the simple answer is, 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 uh, is clear. Uh, we're here because of one man, Vladimir Putin. Now, if we try to figure out what his objectives were and are, uh, it's not that easy. He gave a 58 minute speech, uh, televised speech a few days before the invasion, explaining his motivation. And there he actually talked about three uh, different reasons uh, for the attack on Ukraine. The first one was uh, a kind of ideological nationalism. Uh, he want, wants to unite uh, the three Slavic peoples of Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and Russia, uh, which he sees as all uh, related to some uh, earlier kind of Russian uh, proto-nationality. So that's the first thing, uniting the Slavs, uniting what he considers to be all really Russians. The second objective is what he calls denazifying Ukraine, uh, Orwellian language, which uh, essentially means uh, getting rid of the current government and replacing it with uh, a government that's loyal to Moscow. And the third objective 
uh, has to do with uh, preventing Ukraine from ever becoming part of NATO and demilitarizing the country, weakening the Ukrainian military. So three uh, objectives. Obviously, we all know that the war hasn't gone exactly as, as uh, President Putin was hoping. And I think that's, uh, he, he's been struck in the last three weeks uh, with three major miscalculations that he made. So first of all, it's pretty clear that he underestimated the strength of Ukrainian resistance. Uh, he thought that Ukraine would uh, surrender quickly, uh, that uh, Zelensky would uh, run away, and uh, it would be a relatively simple military operation to, to march into Kiev and take over. Now, that was based in part on the fact that Poles uh, at the time uh, were uh, saying that Zelensky was very unpopular. His approval rating was uh, between 25 and 35%, and only 11% of Ukrainians uh, said they approved of the Rada, the parliament. So there was a sense that, that uh, the current regime was not popular. And uh, we also uh, have reason to believe that Putin was being given exaggerated accounts of support for Russia uh, within Ukraine, or prospective support for an invasion. Uh, he's, Putin has arrested the head of the FSB Foreign Service, the fifth directorate, uh, Sergei Besieda, uh, in recent days. This was the guy who was in charge of the part of, of the FSB that was uh, uh, involved in Ukraine uh, with uh, covert operatives and also in supplying Putin with information about the situation there. So now he's under house arrest and his deputy also uh, which uh, confirms that uh, Putin uh, feels that he was given uh, inaccurate information. As we know, Zelensky has acted heroically, uh, galvanizing resistance at home and, uh, and uh, inspiring foreign leaders uh, to provide assistance and very tough sanctions. And that brings me to the second major miscalculation that Putin made. Uh, he miscalculated the Western reaction. Of course, as, as uh, Timothy was saying, Putin expected some sanctions, uh, but uh, sources in, in the Russian government suggest that what he expected was perhaps was that Russia would, Russian banks would get cut off from the SWIFT system of bank transfers, and that some imports of software computer chips uh, might be blocked. They had contingency plans for those, but uh, I think nobody expected that Russia would be cut off from its international reserves, that there would be uh, boycotts of Soviet oil and so on. Plus, uh, in addition to Western government sanctions, we've seen a tidal wave of Western companies abandoning investments in Russia, sometimes at huge cost, and stopping sales to Russia. Uh, in the oil sector, BP, Shell, uh, in the consumer sector, McDonald's, uh, has closed down for the moment in, in Russia. And uh, Russian industry is just being cut off from essential inputs and components, which is gonna make a, a big part of industry simply unable to operate uh, in the near future. Economic consequences have been dramatic. Uh, the ruble's down more than 45% this year. Inflation soaring, there's been panic buying of, of food. Uh, the stock market hasn't opened in two weeks, uh, but Russian uh, stocks that are trading on foreign exchanges like the London exchange uh, are worth uh, less than 1%. Uh, so Spare, the biggest consumer bank in Russia, uh, its shares are now worth less than 1% of what they were before the invasion. Uh, the uh, Russian state may very shortly be in default. So this, this week, it's supposed to pay back bondholders, uh, and it's uh, threatening to pay them back in rubles, which would be a violation of the contract. So very soon, uh, the Russian state may be declared uh, in default. Economic growth uh, is certainly not going to be positive, And the estimates are that output GDP may collapse by 10 to 15% this year. I'm, I'm guessing it may, in fact, be more than that. So that was the second big miscalculation, uh, underestimating the Western response. 
And the third miscalculation, it's a little bit less clear yet, uh, but I think he's really under, uh, he's really mis, uh, misunderstood Russian domestic opinion. Uh, so now early polls by pro-Kremlin pollsters do suggest that there's considerable support for the military operation as they call it. But obviously we have to take that with, uh, with uh, a big grain of salt. Uh, this is in a climate of repression in which you can go to jail for 15 years, basically for criticizing the war or even just calling it a war. Uh, the Russian state media are not showing uh, pictures, images of the bombings. Uh, they're not uh, reporting about Russian casualties. Uh, so people are being asked about uh, what many believe to be a relatively successful uh, and minor uh, Russian intervention, military intervention, to prevent what Putin has claimed is completely falsely is a genocide by the Ukrainians against uh, Russian speakers. But so I think we, we don't need to take those polls uh, so seriously, but what, what, what we see is that despite the considerable repression, uh, almost 15,000 Russians to date have been detained for going out to protest against the war. 15,000 uh, going out knowing that they're likely to be arrested uh, and were detained. That tells you something about the scale of the protests and the courage of, of some Russian anti-war uh, activists. 1.2 million Russians have signed a petition against the war. And there've been numerous open letters by journalists, academics, artists, and many others uh, also against the war. If we look at what we know about public opinion before uh, the invasion, uh, there was a poll taken in December, which found that, uh, well, Russians do, uh, do support uh, Putin in standing up against NATO. They have, the majority of Russians basically do believe that NATO is uh, disposed against Russia, trying to contain Russia, trying to, uh, trying to weaken Russia. But uh, only 8% uh, said that Russia should send forces to fight Ukrainian government troops. Only 9% said that they should, that Russia should train or equip separatist forces in the east of Ukraine. So there really was no evidence of support for a war. And uh, in fact, uh, support for military action against Ukraine in polls has been falling since, or had been falling since uh, 2016. So the situation with public opinion will become clearer over time as Russians gradually uh, find out uh, in more detail what's been happening in Ukraine and come to see that the uh, state media has been providing uh, propaganda, basically lies about what's going on. Uh, there have even been some hints of disquiet in Kremlin elite circles, so some prominent commentators, even on state media, which have become stridently uh, pro-war, e even there, some prominent commentators have expressed uh, skepticism about the war effort uh, and uh, mild opposition. Uh, so we'll have to see whether that uh, develops more over time. So where are we at this point? Well, uh, I think Putin probably realizes uh, that this invasion was a mistake based on uh, over optimistic scenarios about support in Ukraine and, and the ease of the military operation, but he continues to press on and uh, there's every reason to believe he'll continue. Uh, bombing the cities more, uh, sending more troops to try and uh, try and take Kiev. The West, meanwhile, is trying to find that perfect combination of economic sanctions and aid to Ukraine that will persuade Putin to back down rather than provoking him to escalate. And that's an extremely difficult uh, challenge. Uh, of course, as you've seen, there are different views about just how far the West should go and what are the most effective uh, steps, what are the most effective sanctions, uh, how great a risk we should take. Um, but that's where we are, we're struggling with that. Uh, and uh, there's no, at this point, there's no clear 
uh, or even uh, apparent uh, path towards a resolution or even an, an armistice. There's negotiations, but it doesn't really seem that the Russians are serious at all about negotiating an end to this crisis yet, this war yet. Uh, so I'll stop there and look forward to answering questions. Okay, many thanks to both of our panelists. Uh, now we have uh, some time for discussion of these issues <clears throat> and we'll be taking uh, questions uh, also from the chat. So please do send those in if you would like to. Um, I'd like to start uh, by asking maybe about the immediate future in, in the Ukraine. Um, so Russia, we know, has the power to destroy. It might not have the power to compel or to occupy. So um, first, how do we see Russia's current strategy in Ukrainian cities? Uh, in what specific ways is Russia targeting civilians to break the will of the Ukrainian people? Um, and second, if Russia isn't successful with what it's doing now, should we expect an escalation of violence against civilians from where it is today? And uh, if so, what should we expect that to look like? Okay. Uh... So Tim obviously isn't here to answer that, so I'll do my best. And that's really about five questions, Rob, uh, five difficult <laughs> questions. So let me uh, start, and I'll probably forget some of them, but you can remind me. So first of all, what is the Russian strategy? Well, it seems to be just a continuation of what they started with. So they, they apparently thought that uh, they could take Kiev in two to three days. Um, and they moved, uh, as we saw, on, on all fronts from the, from the north, from the south, from the east. Um, they've done a lot better in the south uh, than in, in the north, uh, so they've made some progress. The basic strategy is to, is to encircle the cities uh, so that they can then uh, cut off supplies and uh, force uh, a surrender of the cities. Uh, that hasn't worked anywhere except the southern uh, city of Kherson. And in Kherson, what they seem to have tried to do is to quickly install a pro-Russian uh, government. Uh, the mayor of Kherson was kidnapped by uh, presumably Russian uh, troops or paramilitaries, uh, and they've been trying to create a pro-Russian administration there. They obviously have a, a a military administration, but to create some kind of political administration. Um, but they're facing resistance from the Kherson uh, legislature, the, the, region, the city uh, council. So it's not quite clear what's happening there, but there's been talk of creating a Kherson People's Republic uh, parallel to the uh, Donetsk People's Republic and Lug Luhansk. People's Republic, these self-declared republics in the East. We don't know where that's gonna go. Um, in terms of the military strategy, uh, I imagine that they'll continue trying to take these cities. They may succeed over the next few weeks. It's hard to rule that out. And uh, one development that we saw over the weekend was this uh, rocket attack uh, on the base in the West of Ukraine near the Polish border uh, where training operations have been going on where Western advisors had been training uh, Ukrainian forces and uh, which was important in the supply chain of weapons coming in from, from the West. So that's how I see it. it then, the, then I think, Rob, you're asking a lot of questions about where it could go from here. What are the chances of escalation? Um, and yeah, there, I mean, I, I was... I'd like to get to broader escalation eventually, uh, but but in the meantime, just from the point of view of Ukrainian civilians and and what the military strategy is, I mean, do we do we think that Putin, you know, obviously as you've said, things haven't gone to plan, and so you know, there's a question about whether the plan is is going to change in some way, whether within Ukraine, uh, whether the strategy of breaking the will of the civilian population is, is going to escalate in some sense. Um, and, or whether we think that, that in fact Putin will 
you know, if he's not able to achieve uh, what he set out to, will will he in fact uh, decide that that's all right? You know, what, or will he he escalate? Because he does have the power to escalate in in dramatic uh, in terms of destruction in dramatic ways. Um, so so do we do we expect that to happen? I mean, what do we think is the near term future? I guess. I know that's hard to answer. It's hard to it's hard to know, and, and we're hesitant to prognosticate. But what do we think is coming? Well, so far there's no sign that he's ready to de-escalate. Uh, so it's more likely that there'll be continued heavy bombing of the civilian areas, and uh, there's been there've been enough strikes, uh, bombs falling on civilian targets that it's really. Uh, pretty clear, and there's also been intercepted uh, communications, I believe, that that document that uh, there have been deliberate targeted, it has been deliberate targeting of civilian, uh, civilian areas, civilian targets, uh, to which can only have the purpose of terrorizing the population to try and bring the war, uh, to, to advance Russia's goals and bring the war uh, to an end on Putin's terms, um, there's no reason to, to imagine at this point that it would stop. Um, of course, these are being investigated already by the International Criminal Court. It's a war crime to target civilians. Um, and uh, that process will, will continue. I'm sure it's not going to affect uh, Putin's calculus. Uh, if this, if at some point he feels that uh, Russian troops can't take Kiev or that uh, he needs for whatever reason, because of Western pressure or, 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 or whatever, to settle on some uh, less ambitious outcome, people have talked about the possibility that he would uh, try to negotiate a situation in which he'd withdraw to Donetsk, Luhansk in the east, and then the south, keep the south of Ukraine along the coast as a land bridge between the Eastern Republics and Crimea and, uh, and, and settle for that. Um, but we're not there yet. There's no evidence that, that he's ready to accept something like that. And I, I don't think uh, the Ukrainian side would accept that in a negotiation. Uh, so uh, this is all speculation at the moment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Uh, well, that those were difficult questions. So they're all difficult questions, I'm sorry to say. Um, but uh, we have right now 95 questions in the Q&A. So I'd like to turn to some of those. And uh, a big winner in terms of what people would like to know about is the no-fly zone. So the US and NATO have said that they are not going to do it, that, they, that we should not do it uh, for the obvious reason that then uh, we would be having conflict with another nuclear power. But is there any scenario in which uh, this might be a good idea? Uh, obviously, uh, Timothy uh, Milovano has uh, made a powerful case that that this is the right thing to do, and uh, and challenged us uh, to be careful when we are um, potentially uh, disagreeing uh, with that. Um, and so I think we need to take it very seriously. Uh, should a should a no fly zone be contemplated? Well. Okay, so um, I'm not a military expert. Here's, here's what I understand. Uh, a no-fly zone, even if you know, implemented by NATO, uh, would not uh, stop long dis or longer distance missiles being fired from within Russia uh, into, to, to hit civilian targets and, and other targets. Uh, it would stop bombers, it would stop planes uh, flying to deliver bombs, but uh, Russia has lots of missiles. So it's not clear that that would be, 
a fund uh, would fundamentally change the situation. Now, there's uh, this, this various different steps that could be taken short of having NATO pilots uh, flying in the skies over Ukraine and, uh, and fighting against uh, Russian pilot pilots. Um, one would be to provide the planes to, to Ukraine, which Ukraine has requested. We had a, a long discussion last week about whether uh, MiGs could be provided by Poland uh, to Ukraine. Uh, there was a proposal to have them transferred via Ramstein uh, Air Base in, in Germany. Uh, the US Biden administration eventually said, no, uh, they're not prepared to do that. But that would be one lesser option to have Ukrainian pilots flying uh, MiGs provided from outside. Uh, perhaps an even better option would be to provide advanced anti-aircraft systems uh, to enable Ukraine to better defend the skies uh, against not just planes, but also missiles. Uh, and uh, I'm, as I said, not an expert on this, but uh, that is something that we could, you know, put more focus on getting uh, advanced anti-aircraft systems uh, into Ukraine uh, to, to beef up the, the defenses. Now, there may be technical issues that I'm not aware of, uh, but some people have recommended that. And I would say perhaps less focus on NATO no-fly zones, since it's probably not going to happen, uh, and think about alternatives that could uh, help with the air defense uh, short of that. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so um, Michael Che, the uh, department chair, uh, tells me that he has some messages uh, from Professor Milovanov. Uh, so um, Michael, if probably if it's a good time now, you think it's uh, important now to read, uh, please. Oh, sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, okay. I can turn my camera on, but I'll just speak. He just, um, I've just been texting him and um, he just wanted to say for now, he said, what happened if there was a, so this is Professor Milovanov, um, what happened, there was a warning that rockets are flying in our direction, probably strategic bombers. We were asked to shut down electricity, lights, and go to shelter. I am there now. If it is over before the end of the event, I will rejoin. And uh, he also asked me to, uh, you know, um, promote his, the, um, the donation page of the Keep School of Economics. So I'll do that maybe toward the end. But anyway, that's where um, Professor Milovanov is now. So hopefully he'll be able to join us later in our event. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, we'll, we'll hope that he can. Um, okay, well, um, I want to ask a little bit about, about, you said there was one man who was responsible, and that is Vladimir Putin, and you have spoken to this man and, and have insight into what's driving him, and, and you gave us some reasons. We have a question in the chat from our colleague and friend, uh, Lynn Vavrek. Uh, who who wants to know if we should think of Putin as rational? Uh, so that that will be that will be an interesting one uh, to contemplate. Um, but maybe also, um, I'd just like to broaden the question out a little bit uh, and say, I, you know, I think I think there's a kind of a bifurcation in the debate uh, in the West between those who think that. Um, you know, that on the one hand, uh, this is about Russia and the Ukraine, right? That it's some that really what it's about is, uh, you know, this leader who had an idea about recreating uh, empire perhaps, and uh, a kind of historical narrative and historical grievances that, that led to where we are. And then on the other side is uh, this case that it's really about Russia and, the West, Russia and the United States. And the people that believe that argue that it has a lot to do with NATO expansion, pushing up to Russia's borders um, and, um, and place more blame really uh, for the current pass on, on US policy uh, and in, including uh, President Biden in particular. So, um, I suspect that we'll we'll say it's it's maybe a little bit of both, um, but how can we weight these things? And maybe how can we understand the evolution of Putin's thinking? Uh, and has he 
evolve in a rational way. So there's a set, another set of questions for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I want to just say that I've, I've spoken to Putin for five minutes. I've shook his hand <laughs> three or four times. Um, you don't get tremendous insight from that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but um, I did, when I spoke to him, I, I did ask about his decision making in, uh, in the case of Crimea, how he decided, how he made the decision to uh, go into Crimea with the troops. Um, I asked if it was something been, that had been planned for a long time or if it was spontaneous. He said, spontaneous. We saw what was happening in Kiev. That is the, uh, the Maidan and the uh, flight of Yanukovych in 2013, 2014. And, and he said, and we, I, we decided we had to do this. And uh, I asked if he consulted with his aides. And he said, no, I, I told them we'll do this, then we'll do that. And then he said, uh, you know, uh, I was even surprised by how well it went. And that gets at something. I think Timothy mentioned earlier that uh, uh, he's, he, this isn't his first war, that, that Putin uh, used military force very brutally in Chechnya. Uh, then there was the war in Georgia in 2008, uh, intervention in Syria in 2015, and of course, Crimea before that. Uh, so I would say that he's, he's used military force on a series of occasions, and each time it's, it's pretty much worked. I mean, it took a long time in Chechnya, uh, but basically uh, he's come out of that with, uh, with the idea that uh, these tools are pretty effective. Uh, and uh, in the case of Crimea, he was even uh, surprised at how well it went. Um, so I think that sets, sets the uh, stage for what we see now, uh, not in the sense that he had some sort of uh, long, consistent, long, deeply held, consistent uh, strategic objective to increase the uh, size of Russia or to, to fight NATO or anything else, but that he's taken a series of gambles um, uh, at increasingly high risks and to date, they've turned out, in his view, well. Um, the question about is he rational is a, is a difficult one because what's the alternative? I mean, we're all partly rational, and partly irrational. Um, but if we, if we think about this decision, I think there's a lot of evidence that he didn't have correct information. So that in part, uh, he was operating with, with uh, poor information, uh, which was itself a result of an information environment that he created. Uh, over time, he's stopped listening to people around him uh, who in the past would, would challenge his judgments, would uh, tell him things he didn't want to hear. Uh, so he's created this environment in which everybody seems to be afraid to tell him things that uh, he won't like. And as a result, they gave him a picture of Ukrainian society as being, uh, you know, really, uh, supportive of Russia, uh, Ukrainian people as being opposed to these so-called neo-Nazi rulers. And it's very possible that he believed at least uh, a significant part of that. Um, so the information was bad. And I, I think I'm, I'm on the side of people who think that there was a lot of emotion in this decision too. Uh, clearly looking at how he talks about Ukraine uh, that 58 minute speech before the invasion, it was extremely emotional. Um, so I, I, I think if, if emotion is, is the alternative to rationality, then yes, I think there's, it, it feels as though there's, there's uh, a lot of emotion there, which of course is combined with uh, a lot of sort of means ends rationality, thinking through the logistics, thinking what's possible, anticipating reactions. And that also he, he clearly did imperfectly. Um, in terms of what this is really about, is it, is it really about uh, Slavic unity or is it really about Russia being challenged by NATO in the US? Um, well, we see that in his speech, he, he mentioned both of these uh, and uh, he, 
and I think he, well, we don't know what he really believes, but he seems to believe that both of those uh, are important. On the issue of NATO though, and NATO expansion, uh, I have to say that I do think personally that it was a, it was a great mistake the way the West handled that, the expansion of NATO in the, in the 90s and 2000s. Um, I think opening the door, opening the door for Georgia and Ukraine to be members of NATO at the Bucharest summit in 2008, but then not actually starting on a, on a plan to make that happen. I think that was uh, a terrible decision and uh, clearly created some of the problems we face. All right, Tim's back. Uh, yeah, I'm back, but I cannot, uh, yeah, I cannot talk for long, unfortunately, but I'm back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just quickly finish what I was saying and then maybe we can take a question for Tim. Um, NATO expansion, I don't think it was the key issue. Uh, if you look at what people who've dealt with Putin over the years say, Condoleezza Rice, uh, who was uh, involved in all the negotiations with Russia and, uh, and the George W. Bush, then Mike McFall, who was involved uh, under Obama, both of them have said that uh, Putin almost never brought up the issue of NATO expansion in uh, talks with the US leadership. That he, of course, he this flared up at the Bucharest summit in 2008. He, he, he talked about it a lot then, but on all these other occasions, he very rarely raised the issue of NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. um, I also just, a, a few years ago, 2017, I had the chance to meet the then president of, of uh, Ukraine, uh, Poroshenko. And I asked him exactly the question, would things, did he think things would have worked out better if Ukraine had uh, signed a document, signed a, an agreement with Russia uh, saying that Ukraine would never be a member of NATO? So establishing neutrality. And Poroshenko, uh, uh, gave the example of Moldova. He said, you know, Moldova, first of all, they passed a law committing not to, to join NATO, uh, thinking that that would persuade Russia uh, to take its troops out of Transnistria. It's, there were still Russian troops in Moldova. Uh, but the Russian told them, uh, Russians told them the law is not enough. You have to put it in your constitution. So they put it in their constitution. And then Poroshenko said, well, then the Russians said, that's not enough. You need to put it in some sort of international treaty. And then they put it in uh, the Istanbul, Istanbul summit uh, document, an international uh, agreement. Uh, but despite that, the troops are still there in Transnistria. So Poroshenko's view was they will demand this, but uh, that's not the real reason uh, for continued Russian aggression. So I'm, I'm a bit skeptical that it's really about NATO. Of course, Putin knew that Ukraine was not going to join NATO anytime soon. Uh, but uh, in the big picture, of course, for many Russians, uh, the fact that NATO expanded right up to their borders is perceived as, as, as aggressive and, uh, and, and threatening. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, I want to... Uh ask a little bit about uh, best case scenarios um, within the scope of the plausible. Uh, basically, I wanna ask, uh, is, there, is there a best case scenario? Uh, what does it look like? I mean, I assume that it's holding out, uh, showing Russia that it would be too costly to continue. Um, so maybe you can help us understand what, what the real hope is now. What, what are what, when people think this is really what we're hoping is going to happen? Maybe you can spin that out for us and help us understand it a little bit. Um, you know, suppose that Russia does go. I mean, it's still going to be there on the border, and it's still Russia. Um, so, does that look like a declaration of neutrality on the part of of Ukraine? Does it um, does Ukraine get even closer to the West? Does it establish some sort of new uh, compromise arrangement with Russia? Um, you know, how's, how's this going to work? And, and, um, and maybe just generally, how do you think about best case scenarios? Yeah, if, if, 
If Timothy was available, we'd like to hear from him, of course. Yeah. Tim, are you there? I am here, but I might need uh, two or three more minutes. I'll be with you, absolutely. If you can give me two or three more minutes, I'll be with you. Of course, of course. Okay. So let me take a stab at that. Um, best case outcome. I, I think it's important, not just for Ukraine, but for the West, for the Western world, that Putin not be seen to win in this case. If he wins, it changes not just the situation in Europe, but the situation in the world. Aggression is seen to have succeeded. Uh, revisionist leaders all over the world will take that to heart. Uh, the Russia-China uh, entente will deepen um, and challenges to the West will increase. I think so. I think that's very important. And obviously it's important for Ukraine. It's a matter of life and death, whether the country uh, continues to exist. Um, one outcome which is unlikely, uh, probably very unlikely, but which could be seen as a, uh, as a path to something better would be the change of leadership in Russia. Um, now, most people feel that a, a military coup is extremely unlikely because in part the military has a strong tradition of not intervening in politics, although in 1991 it got dragged in, but also because there's a very large department of the FSB, the security services that are constantly monitoring that it deeply, uh, deeply in, implanted, embedded in, in, in the army. Uh, so that makes any kind of conspiracy very difficult. But there might come a point at which a combination of uh, social unrest, uh, mass protest, probably about the economic situation, uh, came together with deep discontent in the higher levels of not just the military, but the security services, and perhaps anxiety about a leader who seemed to be no longer uh, rational or fully in control. And that could lead to some sort of uh, regime change, uh, change of leadership. Of course, uh, you asked about optimistic scenarios, and that's a, that's a very unlikely scenario. Um, but my sense is that if a new regime came to power in Russia, perhaps not immediately, but in the medium run, it would turn out to be a much more uh, democratic and uh, to some extent pro-Western regime than the one obviously we see now. Yeah, thanks, Tim. My follow-up was going to be, um, what if uh, Putin stays in power? Uh, what then does an optimistic scenario look like? And uh, Professor Milovano, are you uh, ready to join us? now? Yes, I can talk with you uh, for a little bit. We'll see the situation here is fluid, unfortunately. So Absolutely. basically, we had a little bit more intense yeah. warning than usual. So we had to yes. evacuate. It's when they sent uh, ballistic missiles in, in this area, then we they announced it and everyone has to close the light, you know, shut down the lights, close the windows and run down. And so it's kind of yeah. fluidish here, but it doesn't have, you know, now it's, it's okay. It's supposed, but I might have to go, but anyway, yeah. So I'm happy to answer questions. You might, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Whatever you think is most efficient. Thank, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for that. What we were just talking about uh, is um, sort of the best case or the optimistic scenarios within the scope of the plausible um, and sort of what it is that, that, that you hope will happen over the kind of medium term. Um, so um, let's say uh, that uh, Putin is still in power, that he doesn't lose power somehow. So he's still there. Um, then um, you are able to survive this assault. Uh, I presume Russia uh, deciding that it's too costly and going home would be part of the outcome that one hopes for. Um, but then after that, uh, what, what do things look like? Um, so do you, um, do you hope to be closer to the West at that point? Do you hope for a different sort of relationship with Russia? Do you hope for a, for a neutral 
um, some sort of guarantee of neutrality uh, to both sides. Uh, how do you, you know, Russia is still there. Russia is still Russia, the largest country on earth. Um, it's not, it's not disappearing. So how, how do you think about what you hope for in the so, medium term? Um, So I, I think, first of all, uh, this is just an episode. Uh, and if it's not resolved fundamental, there'll be just another one. We've seen that in 2014 in Crimea and the east of Ukraine. We've seen that in 2008 in Georgia. We've seen that in Syria. Uh, Professor uh, Trisman just talked about uh, Moldova. Uh, you have Belarus, you have, um, you have uh, Kazakhstan, you have a, a bunch of it. So, you know, I don't think it's, a, it's an isolated uh, war. I think it's a, it's a pattern pattern that, uh, uh, yeah, my apologies for, um, pattern that many of us uh, didn't realize what it is. And if you think really in terms of uh, um, bombing, for example, bombardment or cruelty, that was done in, in uh, the cruelty was in Chechen's war. Grozny was there. If you think about bombardment using, uh, actually bombarding cities, that was done in Georgia. If you think about a cruelty with respect to population, that was done in the east of Ukraine. So it's just the scale, which is different, not the methods. So, uh, and uh, I, I don't, I actually, you know, I would like to see someone maybe can offer me an example of a agreement with Russia where they have not uh, renegotiated it or reneged on it within, uh, you know, a month or two. I think Zelensky came into office uh, with, uh, with the, an attempt and understanding. He was a centrist. Uh, and he was a Russian speaking centrist uh, from Kriviri, from the East. And he was uh, trying, and he was actually, you know, Putin had as good chance with him as with anyone to be able to negotiate any deal. You know, they were even, you know, open to, you know, ceasefire, prisoners exchange. And later, uh, if those steps went through, they would have been talking about, uh, for example, um, I don't know, even some kind of agreements and joint investments and all kinds of things I could have imagined that had it gone any time during the last 30 years. But Russia has always used a stick. It has never been a carrot. And uh, that's probably is, is, is really their downfall because they managed to turn the entire country. Uh, you know, they, we used to have uh, away from them. We used to have um, uh, you have we, we used to have the um, uh, polls showing that in the east of Ukraine majority was pro-Russian or you know as you know kind of uh, was concerned. I myself you know I only kind of got Ukrainian identity because I'm ethnic Russian. You can say according to Russian definition, but in 2004 when they were trying to push this uh, you know poison uh, poison our president uh, uh, Yushchenko that uh, you might remember that in the news. In the, you know, 2004, Russia was accused of poisoning our presidential candidate and pushing another candidate. Um, and that candidate Yanukovych later fled to Rostov in 2014. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a long story. Uh, and then you add to this the history of Ukrainian people. Uh, uh, you know, there's Holocaust, but there's also Holodomor uh, when uh, Bolsheviks and communists came. And I think now Ukrainians are seeing what Russia da is doing to us. And uh, it's very reminiscent of what was done to Ukraine in uh, a century ago, you know, by Stalin. Uh, because as I said in the beginning, we had the students who were sitting in the basement. And, you know, if you are without water for, uh, for 10 days, so you, they had some supplies with them in the beginning, but they run out very quickly. And, you know, military just checks on you every day uh, that you are alive, but they don't give you water. That immediately reminds everyone of what it was, you know, in our history books. So now everyone is freaking out that Russia is there really to get rid of us. And what we see is happening in in, um, in Kherson. In uh, I have friends in Kherson that uh, people are, you know, police are just basically snatching uh, Russia police, you know, Russia's, uh, this FSB is snatching everyone who is a member of civil society, journalists, you know, whatever was written in that foreign policy article before the invasion, that they are going, you know, house by house, arresting people and people are disappearing. Uh, my friend is saying that they are arresting and I said, what do you mean they are arresting? Do you know how they've been treated? And he says, no, we don't know. We don't see them ever again. We just hope that they have been arrested.
So all that brings memories and understanding that, you know, there's nothing to negotiate about. Unfortunately, they're doing everything. I think they're speaking to both audience at the same time. They're trying to speak to Europe and say, please negotiate to stop these atrocities. And then uh, speaking to us at the same time with essentially the same language, making sure that we, we understand that if we negotiate or if we, you know, if we somehow uh, submit or surrender that it will be the end of us. Uh, now, I know some kind of rumors that there was a suggestion of certain sovereignty for us. So de facto, it would be the government, uh, or, sorry, the euro, but de facto, there would be a prime minister or someone who is really controlled by Russia. And I think it's also not going to go well. So, so unfortunately, Russia doesn't have a track record to, of commitment to what they negotiate. So I think the best case scenario for us is simply for Russia to run out, Russia runs out of rockets and uh, run, runs out of resources to finance the war. And I mean, not money, but uh, critical elements of import that they need to fix the equipment and so on and so forth. Um, so, and unfortunately that's what we're, I think we're facing. Thank you for that. Uh, I, uh, I personally worry about, um, Professor Treisman said that it was important for Russia to be seen to bear costs and I agree with that. Uh, but I, I also worry about an abject Russian humiliation or one that's uh, perceived that way and, and what that would mean uh, for the future of the world and the need that the Russian regime would feel to demonstrate that it did have capability in the future uh, and also the risks that it might take. Um, so these things worry me. Um, but I, I want to ask you about uh, something else that you begin to touch on there as well. And that is continued Russian expansionism. And maybe both of you could help us uh, to sort of, um, I know it's difficult to, to prognosticate, but to weigh uh, the likelihood uh, that Russia is going to attack Moldova as uh, one chart uh, famously uh, seemed to suggest. Um, Georgia is a place uh, that uh, I wonder about. Um, obviously, there are Baltic states um, that are NATO members. Um, and, and maybe there's broader ambition. So um, I guess that's a question for, for all of us now. Um, how, how should we think about the likelihood of uh, continued Russian expansionism, particularly given the different uh, histories of, of different, uh, different parts of the region? Yeah, I'll, I'll just join and then maybe Daniel can, can go after it and um, just for the future. So I think, first of all, we should not be too, we should be worried, of course, uh, of Russia getting angry and uh, or humiliated or something. But I think we are past that. You know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, I think it maybe has not sunk in yet. And some people are in denial as I was, you know, weeks ago or months ago. It will get to people uh, everywhere around the world. It's not about Ukraine. It has not been about Ukraine. I think what they're actually trying to do to cut through to Moldova right now. It's really costly every time to initiate a conflict. If they can join with Transnistria now, then they can be sitting and destabilizing southern, southern, eastern Europe for decades to come. And I think after that they will try to uh, cut to Kaliningrad because now there will be all the sanctions and Kaliningrad is going to be isolated and it will be the same story as with Crimea. They need to cut to Crimea so that there's, you know, there's water and it's, there are resources there, so they'll have to cut to Kaliningrad. And then they will be able to control, essentially, through destabilization, north of this Central Eastern Europe and south. No one is going to like it, neither China nor the EU, because the trade routes going through this and, uh, but Russia needs access to Black and Baltic seas because if it wants to ever become an uh, economic superpower, they're really still a very small economy. They're the size of Italy. If they want to be a superpower in, a, in any meaningful sense, they need to trade. And trade is done through seas and they don't have access to seas. So they have to get it. And... Uh, so I think that's the next scenario. So it's either now, someone, it, it, Russia will be for, uh, stopped by force and force doesn't have, you know, it will be stopped by force. I know this, that mentality, I grew up in that mentality. Um, and uh, just a second, sorry. Okay, so, and, uh, uh, and uh, I think it, it is really about, you know, that's not, they're not thinking the way we're thinking. 
they, it's it's really a brutality type of of way. It, 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 they are trying to power through. They're trying to, you know, that's what they've done to their own people. And they've done so much damage to Russians that I don't know how they're going to recover from that. But they're trying to now power through with Europe too. So that everyone says, you know, oh, let's just stop it, stop it, stop it. And uh, the, the end result will be if we don't resolve this issue with Russian, you know, aggressive military power in some way in the next, you know, year two or three, then we'll say more and more, they'll just get emboldened. And unfortunately, you know, we'll be having conversations years from now, similar panels, and I'll be telling you, guys, I told you so in 2014, I told you so in 2008, and I told you so in 2022. Thank you. Professor Treisman, did you want to weigh in? Well, that I, I agree with what Timothy has said, at this point, it seems that Putin has committed himself to this uh, approach to the world of, of uh, expansion and aggression. Um, that doesn't mean that he will simultaneously, that he'll have his maximalist objectives everywhere where there are Russian speakers as he has now in Ukraine, but uh, the way he's defined the problem, uh, Coming back to that speech again, in which he talked about the the, the three Slavic uh, peoples, uh, the ancient Russian, he 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 seems to be thinking in terms of this kind of mystical historical Russia, uh, which looks like you know not the Soviet Union but Russia as of the end of the nineteenth century, the old Russian Empire, and basically any of the countries, the independent states today that that were uh, in the 19th century part of the Russian empire have to worry about their security. Uh, he's said in so many words, essentially, that he, he, he wants to recreate this kind of greater Russia. Um, so that's the Baltics, it's, it's the whole of Central Asia, it's the, uh, the Transcaucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and then Romania, maybe Moldova for sure. Uh, so, uh, I think there's no way to sort of roll things back and pretend that, you know, some, some awkward misunderstanding happened in Ukraine. I think uh, we have to reorient to this new world. And at least as long as, as Putin is in power, uh, sanctions, containment, uh, and I, I'm afraid rearmament in the West will have to continue. So uh, there have been some questions in the chat on a um, on how we should think about uh, the nuclear context and the nuclear threats uh, that have been made, and I think it, it's probably a great surprise to uh, many in the United States to know that in fact um, you can't buy iodine pills anymore in much of Europe uh, because people have been buying them in preparation for possible uh, radiation poisoning. And uh, so uh, it's clear that the possibility of, uh, of some sort of use of nuclear weapons is taken, I think, much more seriously in Europe right now than it is uh, in the United States and certainly in, in California, which feels uh, on the edge of the Pacific Rim uh, as far away as, as could be. Um, but I, I, so I'm wondering um, how, um, I mean, somebody said, I, I believe it was Fiona Hill that said that uh, Putin believes that the only reason to have a weapon is if under some circumstances uh, you would use it. So I guess that's a question. Is there, is it, are we at a risk right now? Uh, is this overdone? Um, What's the situation when it comes to possible scenarios where some uh, sort of nuclear weapon is used? Well, okay, so there's really two nuclear issues. And one is not about weapons, it's about power plants. So there's, Ukraine has a lot of nuclear power plants. Uh, the Russian troops have been firing, bombing and firing right around them. And so there's the danger of uh, an escape of radioactive material. Um, the second danger is the danger of use of nuclear weapons. And the Russian uh, military doctrine 
uh, does foresee the use of tactical nuclear weapons under certain circumstances. Those circumstances uh, include a, a direct attack on Russian territory. And uh, the doctrine says uh, the survival of Russia has to be under existential threat. So uh, if the doctrine uh, actually governs uh, how policymakers today, uh, how Putin today is thinking, then uh, the use of tactical weapons could be, tactical nuclear weapons could be uh, imagined if the war were somehow to reach a point where uh, foreign forces were attacking uh, Russian territory. Now they consider Crimea to be Russian territory at this point. So we have to bear that in mind. Uh, if the doctrine is not uh, something that Putin feels constrained by, uh, then all bets are off. We could imagine him uh, escalating to the use of a tactical nuclear weapon uh, if he feels that otherwise uh, he will have lost and that that's the end for him. Um, is that likely to happen? Well, I, I suspect that he still realizes that the first person to actually use a nuclear weapon since, uh, since 1945 uh, would uh, not just be subject to economic sanctions, uh, he'd be uh, the target of enormous pressure from really the whole of the world. It would destabilize things to such an extent that he would really have no friends left, including China. Um, so I suspect that he would be very reluctant to go to that stage. Now, at the moment, there's been a lot made of the fact that Russia, uh, that Putin put nuclear forces on high alert. Uh, we should remember there are four steps uh, in the alert system for nuclear weapons in Russia. And he's gone from the bottom step to the next step up. So there's still, still two more. It goes from uh, constant to uh, elevated to uh, well, the two more steps. So it, it's not as though the missiles are now loaded and targeted and ready to fire. Uh, basically, they've just removed uh, an additional block that would have to be crossed uh, in order for them to send targeting instructions to the missiles and get them ready to be fired. So we're not, we're not close to an actual launch. Um, but of course, it's extremely alarming that he would even raise the, the alert uh, above the sort of constant uh, level it's usually at. Yeah, uh, Professor Ilovano, did you want to um, did you want to say something about either the use of tactical nuclear weapons or the danger to nuclear facilities in the Ukraine? Yeah, so I think there is a maybe a classified piece. Uh, by someone at MIT uh, recording the data, uh, remote data, and then there was a uh, loss of control of access to remote data at the nuclear facilities. And before it happened, there was a spike, thousand times spike at the Chernobyl uh, station. And then it just came back to normal. The and it was simultaneous at all monitors. So explanation to that, it is that the doors to the facility were opened and something was put to it or not, presumably the, uh, the facility was mined. Um, that's one scenario that people are considering, which is consistent with the data. And there are no reasonable other scenarios, but maybe, you know, they were just silly, opened all the doors, put some people there to die from radiation and closed, you know? So that's another scenario or something else. But the doors were, you know, it's consistent with the data and it's the most plausible explanation that the doors were opened and then closed. Um, also, there was electricity cut off recently to um, Chernobyl, damaged because of shelling. And that's important because electricity is required to maintain its an operational capacity. Uh, it was restored uh, recently by Ukrainian uh, services. Mm, somehow there was a corridor to allow for that to happen. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they are mining stations. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, now, on uh, terms of you know 
can we think of what Putin thinks? I think we also should stop <laughs> stop applying our rationality model because we're kind of in a different culture and a different concept. And uh, you know, we just he wants us to second guess, and he plays us quite well. Uh, in fact, um, it's amazing that with such a weak economy in 13, 15 years, he has been able to uh, control the narrative in the world. And that's because he should have been stopped uh, way earlier and uh, his work should not have been taken for granted ever. So we have to base our assessments on, on data and we don't really have insight into war, into what is the thinking there in Kremlin. Um, uh, the US actually controlled the narrative for a while. Uh, just before the invasion um, and it was really unusual so i was kind of uh, my initial assessment was that us is overdoing it but now i thought that it actually uh, helped to undermine the propaganda campaign that russia would have started um, and the world sees uh, what is really happening there were a lot of reporters and uh, now they're trying to shoot reporters so reporters leave and so then they can kind of have uh, continue to construct or it would be easier to construct false reality um, that things are not so bad and then people are willing to believe that so you know there's kind of wishful thinking there it's a natural uh, protection psychological protection mechanism i think they are they are abusing they're doing psych, psych ox, uh, ops all the time and with this nuclear stuff they're trying to threaten us but um i i think in the long run these two words, Putin and nuclear weapons, are not sustainable combination for the world. And I think the West has realized that. And uh, now the job is to design a proper plan so that uh, these two things get decoupled, either nuclear weapons or Putin. Because uh, as I was saying in the beginning, the issue is not really whether he's going to use it right now, but whether he's capable to use it at, at one of these episodes. And you, you can give the answer to that question yourself, and I think I think you know it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we only have a, a few minutes, and and um, I think there are two other things that I'd I'd like to ask about quickly. Um, one is, uh, I guess it's a bit of a selfish question, but it affects us all, uh, and that is. Um, there's been talk about uh, whether there be a so-called asymmetric escalation uh, against targets further afield. Uh, so Putin has said that the sanctions are tantamount to a declaration of, uh, of war. And uh, so then the, the question is, he has obviously lots of capabilities, including particularly cyber capabilities to do damage uh, much further afield in Russia and the United States and around the world. And, and so, um, you know, these are a concern for everybody because it affects the dynamics of the, of the whole conflict. And so is this something that we should expect or uh, do we think that the conflict will, will stay geographic uh, where it is? Well, so I, th I think this is exactly the kind of questions he wants us to wonder about. And this is not the right questions we should be asking. The questions we should be asking is how to minimize his uh, offensive and aggressive capability. We shouldn't be guessing whether it's going to move beyond the current geographic areas. I can tell you the answer, it will. It's the question of when, because every time we thought, uh, I mean, as the world, that's gonna be contained to something, three years or five years into that, we would learn that our assumption about limits on geographical engagement were wrong. So if we actually look at the empirical evidence, we don't have any evidence to suggest that the conflict will not expand. And we have evidence to suggest that it has been expanding. So we would like to believe that there is some reason and the conflict will stop, including the, you know, we, he won't go into, into Baltic countries because it's NATO. What's the evidence for that? That he won't go to, because we believe that NATO will be able to do what exactly? Start a nuclear war with them if he's willing to use tactical weapons. So, you know, we should answer those questions. What are we willing to do and what we are not willing to do? And uh, it's better to answer them before there are contingencies that these questions arise, in which these questions arise. So we should start asking these very unpleasant questions. What we are going to do to prevent Putin from using nuclear weapons or nuclear plants as a tactical 
weapon. And what are we going to do if he uses them? And if we do nothing, then he doesn't even have to use them, but he has one and he will expand and he will control the Europe. Well, at least the East of Europe. Yeah, I, I think we need to ask these questions that, that Timothy is raising um, and we need to rethink. And as I said, we will need to, uh, to rearm and to re, re conceptualize NATO and its defenses. Uh, we'll have to have a very different, well, not a very different, but a, a significantly increased uh, security posture and, and security capacity in, in Eastern Europe. Um, but on cyber, uh, people are surprised that he hasn't used uh, cyber weapons much. Um, he, they may have been trying to use them in Ukraine, and it may just be that the defenses uh, are quite good at this point. Um, but in, in terms of attacking the West, cyber attacks against the US, um, at, at this point, we should also, you know, recognize that what he wants to do today is to win in Ukraine. And that's a big task. It's not going well. Expanding the war to the US or you know, actually provoking an intervention of NATO. Uh, we're worried about what that could mean for us, but he has to worry about what it would mean for him. If he's having difficulty defeating the Ukrainian army without a NATO intervention, uh, then uh, it would not be easier if he, pro he causes some catastrophe in the US and the US decides to intervene more. So um, perhaps it's not so surprising that he hasn't struck yet. Okay. Just add on this, okay. First of all, uh, yeah, so I want to make two points. I think that's again, the way of our lenses where they are wrong, they're kind of victim lenses. What he's gonna do is, you know, you think Ukraine doesn't have the same capability to attack Russia, cyber. You don't think we're attacking? You don't think the best IT guys left uh, Russia for Ukraine? You don't think that the best IT talent uh, would like to live in democratic Slavic country? Okay, so that's the kind of, do you think we're not pushing fakes on them in commu strategic communication operations as they're pushing fakes on us? So the question is not that, you know, there is Ukraine, it's very surprising that you know, you, you mentioned that there could be defenses, but there's the type of thinking should be that actually Ukraine might even have better cyber attack capacity and cyber defense than Russia. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest, just an assumption that this is a military superpower. Yeah, they have more tanks, but they definitely don't have more talent in cyber. So that's one thing. The second one about NATO engagement, do you, let me ask you, the, so, so ask, it's, it's really about asking questions and stop uh, asking you know, unpleasant questions, thinking about what kind of unpleasant questions we want to ask and try not to give answers which are pacifying to us. How many trained pilots of military grade drones do you have Ukraine? Do you think Ukraine have? So ponder about this question. Then the second question is why Yavarif was attacked 14 miles from the border? Why there was a statement of the UK military that some instructors went rogue? If they went rogue, where do you think they are? In Kyiv or in Yavarif? And who do you think was attacked? NATO troops or Ukrainian? Of course, they're not official. And again, this is just speculations you can read in the press and I will never confirm or deny or anything like that. But if you start asking like, questions like that, do you think all instructors left? So I, it's a NATO conflict already. It's just not intense yet. And you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a zero sum kind of uh, war. There will not be a declaration of war on NATO. It's a hybrid warfare. And it's just gonna be gradually escalating and more and more resources of NATO will be engaged, whether we like it or not. So we are at time and, and I don't, and this is, I, 
I'm sure there, there are so many. There are now 164 questions in the chat. So obviously everybody would like to ask lots and lots of more questions and we could certainly do that and I would like to. But I would like to give you, the, you both the chance if there are any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to leave us with, um, you can do that now. Tim. So, all right, I'm going to go. So, uh, thank you. So, my first point is, I've just been making it. First of all, Ukraine has agency. And don't always look at Russia, oh, it's a scary monster. They have their flaws, and Ukrainian military just, you know, hitting where it hurts. And so can the West. There's nothing scary about this. Just hurt Russia, where, but be smart about this. And it requires structural understanding of their supply chains, of their internal politics, you know, and hitting the weakest links. Russia and nuclear weapons are not sustainable in the long run. There's no question about, you know, whether they're gonna use it or not. It's a question of when I think, you know, in the next decade, in two decades or three decades if they're squeezed. Or otherwise, you know, at least Eastern Europe will have to be, um, will have to surrender in some way or another. Then uh, on NATO engagement, no fly zone and everything else, it's not a you know, conventional warfare where the wars are declared. It's a gradual escalation and this escalation is happening. So whether we like it or not, it's not about Ukraine anymore. I think Russia uses the conflict with the West, with NATO in particular, even though it was never about neutrality of Ukraine, it was really about NATO and NATO is being perceived as a threat and it's being attacked. And there's nothing NATO can do about this. So, and finally, I ask you to support our fundraising effort. My apologies for pitching, but people are dying and I need medical kits and each medical kit saves one life when people get cut by shrapnel and they're just 70 bucks and the link uh, was sent in chat, please support. We are US uh, uh, nonprofit 501c3, um, 26 years of experience, audit, IRS, 990 forms, everything. You'll, you'll get your taxes back. You know, you'll, you'll submit, you give us hundred dollars, you'll get your taxes back and you will save a life. It's a good deal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan, did you want to add? add uh, I, I, I echo that. Please help Timofey to help Ukrainians uh, and, and to, and also to support other charities and uh, NGOs that are working in Ukraine. Um, we, we have to help Ukraine defeat Russia in this war. We have to fight for the survival of, of Ukraine. Uh, and it's not, as Timothy has been saying very eloquently, it's not just a fight about Ukraine. It's a fight about the future of the world. Uh, the Putin's unprovoked attack unified the West in a way that was really quite amazing, even to people who deeply believe in the, in the principles and the cohesion of the West. Um, we have imposed uh, very tough economic sanctions. We need to keep uh, increasing these. We need to uh, res respond to escalation of aggression very firmly, uh, if not on the military plane, at least on the economic plane. And I think uh, th the big unknown right at this moment today is what position China is gonna take. Is China uh, going to get more involved in supporting Russia, uh, which will of course make Putin feel, uh, feel more secure? Uh, or can China, uh, well, not be persuaded, but will China on its own come to recognize that that's a losing option that uh, it will lead to more isolation, more problems for China in the long run. Um, but that's, that's what we need to see. If China, I think, decides that supporting uh, Russia in this war is a mistake, then I think the, the people who support the war in Russia will, will be squeezed uh, and things will change. Uh, it's always impossible to predict exactly how regime change comes about but uh, increasing the pressure, cutting them off from essential supplies, I think is, is, is the best strategy at this point. Um, it's an unimaginable tragedy. None of us expected to see uh, a war like this in Europe. Uh, and that should focus our minds. It should make us ask these unpleasant questions as, as Timothy was saying. 
and question all these assumptions that we've made for so long uh, about what was possible, what wasn't possible. Uh, we have to think soberly and not avoid uh, unpleasant, uh, not seek answers which are reassuring but not convincing uh, and figure out how the free countries uh, of the world are going to work together uh, and prevent this kind of aggression from succeeding. So I, it falls to me to say thank you very, very, very much to both of our panelists for sharing their time and insights. And uh, to say, to echo uh, what the two of you have said, uh, that it does seem like a moment to question old assumptions and also a moment where uh, maybe strangely the world feels smaller um, and like we're in this together in a way that um, uh, that that it that it hasn't felt uh, to this degree uh, recently, um, and um, and also the world feels very different, I think, uh, to many of us than it did um, than it did just a few a few weeks ago, um, at least at least uh, at least over here. So uh, let me say thank you once again, and um, we'll I guess leave it there. Uh, but the very best uh, to you. Uh, over there, Professor Milovanov, and to your loved ones and family, and um, well, I think we we have to leave it there today. So thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>